Thank you. You all look really good, graduates. You look great out there. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, um, Dean Babbitt, President Lawrence, the graduation speakers. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Um, a few years ago, uh, two elderly semi-homeless men were standing in front of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in Manhattan during a papal visit. The Pope came out the hotel surrounded by security, waved to the adoring crowd, got into the Pope mobile, and drove off. One of the main men named Sam turned to his friend Bo and said, yo, Bo, man, who was that white dude with that crazy hat on? <laughs> Bo smiled and answered and said, that was the Pope, fool. You ignorant. You don't know anything. You just an ignorant fool. And Sam said, I'm not ignorant. He said, you are too. He said, I'll make you a bet. He said, I bet you that I can ask myself a question and can answer it, and you can ask yourself a question and can't answer it. I bet you a bottle of wine. <laughs> Sam thought about that. I can answer my own question. He said, it's a bet. Bo said, OK, I'll go first. Question, how can a rabbit dig a hole and not leave any dirt around the side? Answer, he starts at the bottom. Bo said, how can a rabbit dig a hole and not leave any dirt around the side? How does he get to the bottom? He said, that's your question, fool. You answer it. <laughs> the seed of critical thinking is the question. What is life? What is love? What is joy? What is sadness? What is pain? Who am I? Who are we? Whether this seed called the question blossoms into art, science, education, medicine, technology, or stagnates and withers into ignorance, acceptance, and oppression depends on whether this seed is planted in a garden of humanity or a desert of control and oppression. We find these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Inspiring words written by men who were gathered in the face of British domination. Revolutionary words, but a contradiction from men who owned slaves and viewed the education of said slaves as bad judgment, and in many cases, a crime that would see the slave who aspired to knowledge starved, beaten, or otherwise tortured. And by the way, the white person or freed Negro who dared to teach them in a summons, ridiculed, beaten, or in prison, and in an economic system that's wealth was based on the free and forced labor of an enslaved class, it, it makes perfect sense that slaves should have been docile and ignorant. Both slave and slave owner needed to believe that the slaves were less than human, smarter than farm animals, but property nonetheless, to be cared for, guided, disciplined by the superior ones. But if I, a slave, could read, do mathematics like the slave master, gaze at the stars and see celestial patterns, and dream of freedom, then it's just a matter of time before I would begin to ask the question, why am I a slave? And begin to think longly and critically about freedom. And so the oppressed class that is educated in the arts and the sciences and has a different self-awareness begins to ask this question, why am I oppressed? If I, a slave, can read and can think and can reason, why am I oppressed? If I, a woman, can read, write, do math, sports, arts, and science as good and in a lot of cases better than any man, then why am I still fighting for equal opportunity, <laughs> equal pay, justice? If I an LGBT queer person, or an immigrant, or a dreamer, or physically challenged, or formerly incarcerated, can reason, can conceive, then I must have the opportunity for this inalienable right to learn and to achieve. In his book, Black Skins, White Masks, 
black French psychiatrist, France Fanon, writes that black people knew they were black because white people told them that they were black. Not just in a cosmetic sense, but through words and actions and deeds that makes them feel marginalized, demonized, and oppressed by a dominant culture. Standards of beauty, ugliness, purity, sin, good, evil, smart, dumb, law-abiding, criminal, become measured in black and white. Be careful around those people. Be extra careful in those neighborhoods. Safer to be among your own kind. But again, a question. This time from a child simply wanting to play in the park with other children. I thought human was my kind. Now, radical transformation happens when we begin to tell ourselves, write our own stories, create our own narratives about who we are and connect that self-affirmation with our brothers and sisters everywhere. I was 15 years old when Dr. King was assassinated, an honor student, a church boy, a member of the NAACP Youth Council. I was an orphan kid being solely raised by his grandmother, a man-child who played baseball and hung out on the streets with older boys in the quest for manhood. I was praised by teachers and at the same time called nigger by fellow students whose parents were workers and the working poor from the same Bronx neighborhood that we lived in, the black kids and the white kids. I was hugged by seniors in my neighborhood for helping them with their grocery bags and smacked around by cops for being on the wrong block. Like so many black kids growing up at that time, I grew up with a dual reality and a dual consciousness. And like so many young black people, I was outraged by Dr. King's death. I got on the subway to the Bronx, or to Brooklyn, to join the radical Black Panthers. I had seen the Panthers on television, marching with their berets, patrolling the streets of Oakland, California, with shotguns and leather coats. We didn't know quite what we wanted to get into, but we know that we wanted to be black militants. In fact, after Dr. King was assassinated, I came to school the next day and told all of my friends that I sat with that I, Eddie Joseph, didn't have the name Jamal at that time, was going to be a black militant. And one of my best friends was a white kid, a Jewish kid named Paul, and he said, Eddie, I don't know if you can say you're going to be a militant like it's a career choice, like a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> I was like, no, Paul, you watch, I'm gonna do this. And so to prove to Paul as much to myself, I had to seek out the roughest, the toughest, the Black Panthers. As I'm riding, my two older friends, who also didn't know much, but I thought knew more than me, leaned over and told me what it was gonna to be to be a Panther. You know it's like the Mafia, man. Once you get in, there's no getting out. I was like, no getting out? But I couldn't be a chump in front of my boys. I was like, I don't care. My other friend said, you're going to have to prove yourself. You know you have to kill a white dude to be a panther. I'm like, kill somebody. I'm in the choir at church. <laughs> I don't care. I can't be a punk in front of my boys. My other friend said, no, get it right. You ain't got to kill a white dude. Oh, thank you. I don't have to kill a white. He says, you got to kill a white cop. And you got to bring back his badge and his gun. <laughs> well, I wanted to run off the train. And I think my friends wanted me to run so they could follow me. But we showed up at the panther office. And when I sat in the back row, looking at all the cool Panthers, the brothers and sisters with their leather coats and their dashikis and the African galays, the older brothers and sisters, let me put this in perspective, I was 15 years old, but they were 18, 19, 21, 22 years old. The person behind the desk was explaining the Panther 10 point program. Go online and read it. It talks about housing, shelter, control of the police, it talks about medicine. It talks about community control. Nothing in there about killing anybody, about bringing a cop's badge and gun, but I'm not listening. I have my inner monologue. As he's reading point number five, which is about education, I jump up and I say, choose me, brother, arm me. I'm the white dude right now. The whole room got quiet. He called me up front, tipped down his sunglasses and said, come here, young brother. <laughs> And as I sat next to the desk, he opened the bottom drawer. As he reached in, my heart is pounding in my skinny little chest. And I said, look how far down he's reaching. He's going to give me a big damn gun. <laughs> and he hands me the secret weapon of liberation. Brothers and sisters, he gave me a stack of books. The autobiography of, of Malcolm X, 
Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, Soul on Ice by Eldridge Cleaver. And I'm thinking because of what my friend said, this must be a test. And so I said, excuse me, brother, I thought you were going to arm me. And he said, excuse me, young brother, I just did. As I'm walking to my seat, he stops me. It wasn't over yet. He said, young brother, let me ask you something since you came in here so mad at white folks. If all of the cops in the community that are brutalizing people, beating them up, locking them up, shooting them down were black and the people being brutalized were white. If all of the people that own the stores in the community that are ripping people off with high prices, spoiled vegetables, rotten meat were black and the people being exploited and ripped off were white. If all of the demagogic fascist politicians were black and the people being exploited and oppressed, would that make things correct? And I thought this time from with my mind instead of my now bruised man-child ego, and I said, no, sir, it seems like it would still be wrong. And for the first time, he smiled and he said, that's right, young brother. This is a class struggle for human rights, not just a race struggle for civil rights. Study those books so you know what true revolution is all about. On the wall was a poster, a quote from Che Guevara from a speech that he gave in the United Nations in 1959. And it said, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, let me say that revolutionaries are guided by great feelings of love. Lessons I learned in the Panther that first day. You need a rainbow coalition. You need to understand that for everyone to be liberated, we all must be free. Yes, the Panthers worked and organized in the black community, started free breakfast programs, health clinics, the breakfast program that became a model for food programs across the country today, done by high school students, college students who were Panthers, people coming out of prison, former street people, people who had been welfare moms that knew that kids going to school on a hungry stomach, maybe that's the problem. Someone saying three apples plus two apples equal five apples is hard to digest in kindergarten or first grade if your stomach is growling. So you organize people around their needs. And you find those connective needs with people in other communities, and you don't let them define you by saying that you're different because you're black, because you're white, because you're this, but that we are a human family and we'll struggle together. And the Panthers said it's not just about black power, it's all power to the people. It is white power, it is brown power, it is red power, it is LGBT power, it is immigrant power, it is power to all people. Second grade life lessons came in prison. When I got to Leavenworth and was faced and was starting to do my 12 year sentence, an old convict named Mr. Cody Mr. came to me and he said, young blood, you can serve this here time or you can let this here time serve you. And I feasted on that wisdom. And I signed up for every program and University of Kansas had a great program that would come in four nights a week. The most gangster person I saw in Leavenworth, and people were doing 50 years, life, double life, just like you saw. I had a little magazine article that I would show about some guys gathered in the yard, and they were like, you know, with the, with the, with the goatees and tats all over their body, and the skull caps looking real rough and tough. And I said, yeah, this is a, a photo taken in Leavenworth. And they said, man, those are some tough looking Latino goes. I went, no, these are the white boys. <laughs> this is how tough Leavenworth was. But the most gangster prison in Leavenworth was a 70-year-old white woman who was about five foot three, who was a professor from KU named Dr. Johnson. She was an English professor. She stood in front of the room of these men that I'm describing and gave us no slap. Mr. Joseph, I know you could do better and would red mark the paper. Mr. Robinson, I know you could do better. One day she came in with the Bible. She had redlined it. She found grammatical errors. We're like, yo. <laughs> She's correcting God. Can't mess with Professor Johnson. In that moment, with no guards, with no bars, we understood her love, her dedication, and sacrifice, and that she cared to ask a question. That these men want to learn. That if they want to study history and math and science and sociology, 
then what makes them prisoners? You're free as long as you're here, she told us. And you'll be free beyond that if you remember the lessons of a mind and that there's no stronger weapon than an armed mind and love. The third thing I learned is when I came home from prison. And like many people, I had plans. I had discovered theater in prison and, and uh, created a theater company. And originally, it was a, a, a theater company with, for just the black prisoners. We were doing a Black History Month play. And some leaders from the Mexican mafia came to the rehearsal. Now, La Emmy never leaves their section of the yard unless they got beef. And if La Emmy got beef, it's usually to kill somebody. So when the two leaders, Tito and Raphael, came to our rehearsal, everybody was there was like, who do they have beef with? I'm rehearsing with two of the guys teaching me with improv. And after about five minutes into the rehearsal, one of the guys pointed at me and was like, yo, Holmes, let me speak to you a minute. And I, came over, I went, damn, it's me. I just got here. <laughs> Tito pulled me to the side. And he said, Holmes, I heard rumors about what you was doing, I said. So I had to come here to check it out for myself. And I'm watching you, you and your man over there, and I'm telling you something, I say, and you need to listen to me good. <laughs> that dude you blessing with right there, that guy, I say, he's not feeling his character. <laughs> so Tito joined the company. And then one of the real tough guys who hung out with bikers in the Aryan Brotherhood came, and his name was Rebel. He went back to his section of the yard and was surrounded by his guys. And he was like, Reb, you was with the blacks and the Latinos? And he said, yep. And Reb was like 6'3", muscular, black belt, could knock you out with either hand, either foot. Right? And an avowed racist. And all the guys came around him, and they said, Reb, you was with the blacks and the Beckers? And he said, yep. They said, well, what are they doing, Reb? He said, a play. They said, Rev, well, what did you do about it? He said, well, uh, they give me a part. <laughs> I learned that you have to let time serve you. And I also learned the power of education and art to break down all boundaries. <laughs> Men who had grown up hating one another Men who in that prison were fighting one another were now together in that classroom and in our rehearsal room making art, and we changed the dynamic. We did it for ourselves. We made the atmosphere adjust. We made that prison adjust to the question that we had asked ourselves and that we were answering. And then the third question was a question of time after I came out of prison. One of my first jobs was working at a place called Changing Scenes, where I was working on people who were or young men who were on probation and mandated to take, as part of this, uh, re, this program, uh, job skills, readiness, and I was teaching the theater program. And I was ready. After all, I had done this when I was in prison. We would do some improv. We would write a script. We'd do a play. They'd invite their family and friends. A few minutes into it, it became clear that I needed to throw my curriculum out the window. These young brothers were talking about who they had beef with, who they were going to beat up, who they were going to kill. And I realized my job as a teaching artist and a formerly incarcerated person was to get them back alive in a week. So I would do improv. We'd do spoken word. I'd take the temperature of the room and try to give them some advice. And it's one of the jobs that I think I didn't do so good with them. I didn't transform them the way I wanted. I hearken back to how long transformation takes sometimes. We think about the end of slavery that I started with, with the Civil War. But keep in mind, there was an abolitionist movement that had existed for 30 years. They had great people like William Lloyd Garrison, a white publisher, Harriet Beecher Snow, the best-selling author at the time, Frederick Douglass, coming together, whites, blacks, poor, rich, freed, enslaved, to create a movement that grew in relenting pressure until this government had to deal with one of the greatest sins in human history. It took a movement. The women's suffrage movement first started declaring itself in 1848. Susan B. Anthony and other leaders would not leave to see the success of their movement. They wouldn't live in 1920 when it first got enough congressional and Senate support for it to be. So movements take time. But a lot of us think, let's deal with the transformation. We want it to happen instantly. I fast forward to about five years ago, I'm walking down the street of Harlem with my oldest son. 
And a young man about 30 years old said, Mr. Josephs, I'm so glad to see you. You don't remember me, but I was one of those knucklehead kids in that program. And I was like, nah, man, you weren't a knucklehead. He was like, no, trust me, I was a knucklehead. <laughs> he said, but you came each week, and you always gave us something positive to think about, and you always said all of this stuff, and it didn't make any sense to me at a time. He said, but about two years later, it kicked in. And I'm so glad that I'm seeing you now. Because I'm a husband now, I'm a father now, I'm a social worker now, thank you. <laughs> Think of time as something that helps you regulate in terms of appointments and in terms of deadlines and goals, but in terms of your life plan, in terms of what you're going to do to transform the world, think of the timeline of life in the way that Native American people do and certain people in Africa. Be in tune with your neighbor, with your environment. Know that when you plant the seeds of something that sometimes you'll see it blossom and sometimes you're planting seeds that you'll see much later on or maybe not in your lifetime, but you did that regardless. As you go forward, congratulations on your accomplishments. Remember, that your education as teachers and as geneticists and as lawyers and as historians and as dancers and as artists and as therapists and all of the things and your desire to change people's lives, your commitment to do this, that is your superpower. You are the real transformers. All superheroes, before you leave the X-Man Institute or the Bad Cave, along, along with your training, there's some things that you want to remember as you're going forth to transform the world and conquer evil. What is your question? And the guiding principles that come from the answer to that question will be what sustains you. Friends may let you down at times. Colleagues may disappoint. Lovers may break your heart. But your principles will help you stand strong. What is your greater love? The people you haven't met, but that you know that are your brothers and sisters. The seeds that you plant for the garden that you'll never see. What is that greater love beyond yourself? And who is your rainbow posse? Not just your digital friends or your Facebook friends, but like as we look out today, that will help you laugh when all seems lost. That will help you cry when you have collectively achieved that crazy, impossible thing that no one believed could happen but you. Hang on to your posse. Hang on to that love. A, a little boy went to the state fair with his family. And there were pony rides and a Ferris wheel and cotton candy. But the thing that really caught this kid's attention was an old man who was giving away balloons. With so many kids and so many balloons next to his helium tank that one of the balloons got away from the old man, a red balloon, and it floated up and up and up. And a few minutes later, a green balloon got away and floated up and up and up. And the little boy couldn't take it anymore. He broke through the crowd and he pulled on that old man's leg and he said, Mr. Balloon Man, did you see that? Did you see that? The green balloon went just as high as the red balloon. That old man looked at that little boy and he smiled and he said, son, Always remember this, it's not the color on the outside, but the stuff on the inside that will make you rise. Rise today, graduates, rise. <laughs>